That will be our hope this morning as we uh, continue to just look to his word and be challenged today as to both uh, who he is and how it is he shows himself to us today. And so I'm going to just pause for a word of prayer once again and just uh, once more acknowledge our time and, and our, our dependence on him and, uh, and then we'll dive right in. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that again as we gather in this place, again we know that you are not a God contained by four walls, that uh, you are not a God that needs to be sung into the room nor prayed into the room, but it says where two or three are gathered, I am there. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so for that very reason this morning, we, we simply begin by saying thank you. Thank you that you are here. Thank you that you are about your purpose, seeking each and every one of us, that you might be seen Thank you that you are a God who reveals himself. And I pray this morning that we would be both attentive and alert, listening and, and longing to see and hear from you. That we might know you, that we, we might walk in your ways. And I just thank you this morning that we can have that very confidence that you are about your purpose. And that today you are speaking loudly and clearly. And again, may we be listening as we read from your word today and these wonderful things that you've preserved for us. In Jesus' name, we give thanks. Amen. All right. Well, as we've been looking and spending time looking at uh, uh, people's uh, encounters with Christ, both the disciples, the Pharisees, and those around him, we've been kind of skipping back and forth in the Gospels, looking at many of the points and places where they spent time with Jesus. And in many, if not most of the cases, were being taught. Taught things that more often than not were either going over their heads or they were learning, but most definitely were not sinking into their hearts. And, and Jesus was revealing himself. He wasn't just revealing himself. He was revealing the Father who had sent him. And yet, around every corner, as much as he revealed, many missed. And so has been over this last little while, many, both encouragements and warnings, about how easy it is to miss uh, the revelation of the one showing the way to life. And, and this morning... That we're going to look at, at the fact that there was a great deal of confusion around his coming. And, and, and I, I love what a friend said, and I, I think I've shared it before, but I'm never too ashamed to share it again. Uh, because it's always good to be reminded of, of the truth. A friend put it this way when there were many fights in the book of Revelation, at whether Jesus would return, and is it pre-tribulation, post-tribulation? And, and my friend said confidently, I, I'm not pre or post, I'm pan. And I said, what do you mean pan? He said, it'll all pan out in the end. I'm confident of this. He, he also said this, and it was it was true, and, and I appreciated it. As many fight with when Jesus will come, and do we see the signs, and will we know the signs? And he simply said, in the midst of the great argument and the latest tabloid in the supermarket, saying, the end times are here, right? And we hear it all the time. And he said, listen, I know this, and only this. Jesus' second coming will probably be as misunderstood as his first. Think about the fact that the people who were closest to him, walking with him, and knew him every day, still seem to miss him in the midst of it. Begging for a seat at his right hand or left time, uh, right hand or left hand, at his throne when he was headed for a cross right? They knew who he was, but were missing how it was he was going to live, how it was he was going to die, and even greater, how it was he was going to rise again. And how often do we miss it? Well, this morning, I'm going to start just by looking at a few verses in John and chapter 8, 
And I'm going to read from the Amplified Version of verse 14, which again is just a a Bible that has given a a bit of added extra words to give a bit more translation to words that often can't be summarized by one word in our English language. Listen to this in John 8, verse 14. Jesus answered, Even if I do testify on my own behalf, my testimony is true and reliable and valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You set yourselves up to judge according to the flesh by what you see. You condemn by external human standards. I do not set myself up to judge or condemn or to sentence anyone. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true My decision is right, for I am not alone in making it. But there are two of us, I and the Father who sent me. I want to stop there, because I want you to notice, as Jesus testified about himself, that there was a lot of confusion, a lot of concern. Pharisees saying in the verse previous, listen, you're testifying on your own behalf. That makes your testimony not valid. Jesus said, listen, my testimony is valid. Why? Because I'm not just testifying about me, but even greater, my father testifies about me. Well, this led to even more confusion. If you go back a chapter in chapter 7, listen, the Jews thought they knew all about Jesus. It tells us in verse 15 of chapter 7, the Jews, it says, were astonished, saying, how has this man become learned, having never been educated? Why were they astonished? Because in their eyes, what was Jesus? Simply the son of a carpenter from Galilee. Listen to what they go on to say in John 7 and verse 25. It says, listen, some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, is this not the man whom they are seeking to kill? Look, he's speaking publicly and they are saying nothing to him. The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? However, we know where this man is from. But whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where he is from. It was at that moment Jesus cried out in the temple it says now listen in their mind they knew who jesus was they knew where he was from now i'm going to move to john chapter 8 and i'm going to read a few verses for you this morning and and note what he says john chapter 8 and verse 19 and following and it says this john 8 verse 19 they were saying to him Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. When he said again to them, I go away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, What have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things As the Father taught me, he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Now I'm going to stop there, and I want to note that as Jesus spoke, everything he spoke of 
was rooted in the Father, was rooted in not just who he was, but where he was from. Not of this earth, but of the heavenlies. Not of an earthly father, but a heavenly one. And now, just by their questions alone, right? Listen, John 8, verse 19. They said to him, where is your father? John 8, verse 25. Who are you? And his response, what have I been saying all this time? Remember when he had just done the miracle and he had taken those few loaves and few fish and broken them and made the many eat? And immediately after, remember the response? <laughs> Jesus, what miracle do you do that, that we might know that you are the one that we might follow you? They saw they heard, and yet what? Didn't believe. And yet the evidence was all around them. But there was something standing in the way. Something was stopping them. They had become blind. And this morning, uh, it's interesting to look back and see a man speaking, Jesus, of his father, and yet the many questions that surrounded, and, and to be honest, there are many questions, because there are not many people who, like Jesus, have two completely different genealogies in the Bible. Have you ever noticed that? One in Matthew 1, and a different one in Luke chapter 3. And often the question, so which one is right? Good question. Because they couldn't seem to put their finger on the fact that they knew who, who he was and where he was from. And yet, here's the question, who are you and where are you from? Right? Fascinating, in our time working in the Bible college, we had the privilege of having many lecturers in from around the world. One of our favorites each time of the year was a man named Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. He was a Messianic Jew from Ariel Ministries and often would lead people on uh, tours of Israel, most of which, the ones he took you on, you'd get shot at. So uh, not many of us were able to go, though we wanted to, uh, because there's nothing like getting shot at in the Holy Land. So uh, listen, fascinating thing. We spend a great deal of time with us looking at the scriptures, looking at the life of the Messiah, looking at Jewish customs. One of the things that he pointed out was fascinating in the fact that this, the genealogy in Matthew, if you want to look at where Jesus is from, in fact, that first genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 does not show Jesus as one who is authorized to take the throne of David. In fact, if you're to look at the the, the genealogy of Matthew 1, it actually shows that a descendant from this genealogy is not included in David's throne. They should be excluded from David's throne. Scary thought <laughs> in the moment. Fascinating genealogy for a few reasons. One, it is a genealogy that steps outside of Jewish tradition. Meaning, one, it skips names. It doesn't thoroughly go through the birthright. It actually skips names. Two, it actually includes women's names, which in that day and age, uh, women were, were not included in genealogies. Legal genealogies were always by the man's family name. And, and strangely enough, four women are included in Matthew 1. And what's their common bond? All those women are Gentile women. Tamar. Uh, you have uh, Bathsheba. You have, uh, who is in, um, excuse me, I'm having a, a, a brain lull. Rahab, the harlot in the walls, right? You have these women included who are Gentile women. And so th there's another name that as you read on in Matthew 1, it actually tells you a name shows up named Jehoiakim. A and often in the different translations and language, that name shows up differently. But that name alone stems from a prophecy I in the book of Jeremiah 22. And I want you to note what it says. Listen to this. 
verse 24 in Jeremiah 22. As I live, declares the Lord, even though Kaniah, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, it says, were a signet ring on my right hand, yet I would pull you off, it says. I will give you over into the hand of those who are seeking your life. Yes, into the hand of those who you dread. Even to the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. I will hurl you, it says. It goes on and says this in verse 30. Thus says the Lord, write this down, childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will prosper, sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. Tough prophecy, isn't it? So note, no one would rule. And so when you look at that name, that genealogy, it's fascinating because one, it shows you an inclusiveness of the Gentiles it shows a genealogy, yes, from the line of David, but no, not in the rightful heir to the throne of David. Well, what contrasts over in Luke chapter 3 is a different genealogy, but here's what's interesting as we spent time studying with the doctor. Fascinatingly enough, it follows complete legal Jewish custom. It is right, and it follows every name in the genealogy. But as you look at that genealogy, one thing to note, that if Matthew 1, which the book of Matthew, if you've ever noticed, follows the storyline of Joseph, it shows Joseph's vision, Joseph hearing from the angel, Joseph's response to the pregnancy of Mary. Luke is a book that follows the story and perspective of who? Mary. Mary's response to the angel, Mary hearing from the Lord. And when you look back, it was entirely within Jewish custom to have a daughter's genealogy included, but her inclusion would be not by her name, but to make it legal by the son-in-law's name. And so that genealogy from Joseph to the line of David, different from Matthew 1, if Matthew 1 is following Joseph's story... Luke is following whose? Mary's. Who also was a descendant of who? David. Who was whose attachment to the line to the throne that God was going to have the Messiah born in. Jesus was not coming in the line of his stepfather, Joseph the carpenter, was he? Who was he coming from? Whose father was his. God, through a virgin, whose name was Mary, and his earthly attachment to that line would come through her. You see, the truth was there. He was born, he was in line, and he had every right to the throne that God was bringing him for. I hope this is making sense. Because Jesus checked all the boxes. In fact, if Joseph was his father, he couldn't be the king. Nor could he be the king we were longing for or the Messiah they were waiting for. But as a descendant of Mary, he could, he would, and he will be. But though all the evidence was there, they were missing it. But here's the problem. They kept looking, and God kept showing up in ways in which they didn't expect. He kept arriving outside the box that they had created for him. And this morning, if there's any challenge, and I had just read for you from John 8 and chapter 14, uh, sorry, John chapter 8 and verse 14, Talking about Jesus saying, listen, my judgment is true. My decisions are right, for I am not alone in making it. He said, listen, I judge according not to the flesh, which you see, but according to the Father. I want you to hear uh, uh, it put by a man named Eugene Peterson, who wrote a, a translation or a paraphrase of the Bible, something that's a, a nice devotional read, and he often uh, 
devotionally writes things in a way that, that can be quite profound. And I want you to hear how he put it. Listen, he says this in John 8 verse 14, and he puts it this way. You decide according to what you can see and touch. I don't make judgments like that, but even if I did, my judgment would be true because I wouldn't make it out of the narrowness of my experience, but in the largeness of the one who sent me. I want you to think about that for a moment. He says, listen, I don't make judgments like that. But even if I did, my judgment would be true. I wouldn't make it out of the narrowness of my experience, but in the largeness of the one who sent me. You see, as Jesus looked out at the world, as he engaged in his daily life, it was always rooted in what? Not the narrowness of his experience, but what? The vast capacity of what the Father was giving him. And today, as we look at our surroundings, as we look at our life, as we venture for our own livelihood today, we can do that very thing. We can continually be viewing through the lens of the narrowness of our own experience. What we think about God, what we perhaps past tense think we've seen of God, what we've heard about God. And the challenge today is to open our eyes and ears to the vastness of what is God. Now I'm going to say a challenging statement here, which at first, and it's one in which we need to be very careful. Listen, we spend a great deal of time going to a great many churches in our travels serving in ministry. One of my favorites was going to an Anglo-Catholic church that was so high Anglican, it was almost Catholic. And there was a philosophical priest who, who had taken a vow of chastity, a vow of celibacy. He had been educated at Cambridge. He was a, 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 in the order of a certain type of monk, very intellectual. And whenever he would have me come through, he was often shocked and amazed at my simplicity, probably because I speak to the level of a grade three. Um, my kids were reminding me as at the end of the school year here that my spelling might just be at the level of a grade two. So, uh, listen, <laughs> he would often say as I would share, wow, that's so simple. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> and I'd go, <laughs> that's because you're not slow like me. But listen, often he would get lost in his own philosophical ramblings. He'd often lose me. But there was one morning he got me. And he got me thinking. And this morning, though we need to be careful, I want to challenge you in something. He said this. Listen, if you ever come to a why in the road, and one road leads to truth, and one road leads to Jesus, which road do you take? Now the Sunday school answer in me wants to go, Jesus, right? Every time. But I want you to listen to what he said that morning because it was profound. And for this morning's passage, it brings an important point. He said this that morning, as I was preparing my Sunday school right answer. Listen, he said this, if there's a why in the road and one road leads to truth and one to Jesus, he said, listen, always take the road to truth. Because at the end of that road, if you are really looking for Jesus, you will find him at the end of the road of truth. The real Jesus. But if you head to your idea of Jesus, the man with the long hair, the beard, <laughs> the, wh the white robe and the blue sash, right? If you head to what you think is Jesus, you may be following a red herring. Interesting thought this morning. One we need to be careful with, right? Because we live in a day and age where people say this, whatever's true to you is true to you. Whatever's true to me is true to me. Tough words, right? Because everything can't be true. Can't be. Not possible. But listen, if you are truly seeking truth, 
the real Jesus will be there. The real Jesus. Not your idea of Jesus. And here's the problem. Jesus kept saying, I am the Father one. Here's who I am. And they kept missing it. Why? Because Jesus kept showing up outside of their ideal an idea of who the Messiah would be, right? How did he do it? He'd heal on the Sabbath, and in their mind, what? God doesn't do that on the day of rest. His disciples would eat bits of grain off the stalk uh, on their journey on the Sabbath. And, And they'd say, we don't eat on the Sabbath that way. Never. And how many times have you caught yourself saying those words, never? Listen. Listen, God doesn't work in that denomination. He works in this one. God doesn't work in that church. He works in this one. God will never save that person. He'll save that one. God doesn't speak through someone like that. God wouldn't speak through someone with that kind of background. God wouldn't speak through someone dressed like that. God wouldn't speak through someone. And then he raises Paul, the murderer, right? Who was Saul, the persecutor of the church. Oh, yes, he does. And then he uses David, an adulterer. And he says, here's a man after my own heart. Not flawless, flawed, but after my heart. I can use him as king. Oh, yes, he does. How many times have you written off a congregation, a denomination, a person, and say these words, God's not there, won't be there, can't be seen there. And here's God. Just wait and see. How many times do we say, God won't show up there? God couldn't show up in that way. God won't show up this time. Or for that person. You see, Jesus kept coming. And the problem was, They were blinded by their own, what, box that they thought the Messiah would be in. He's going to look this way. He's going to act this way. He's going to be this way. And here's them. We know where you're from, Jesus. But when the Messiah comes, we won't know where he's from. What has Jesus been saying the whole time? I know where I'm from and I know where I'm going. Later on, John chapter 9, he's going to open the eyes of the blind man. Something no one had ever done. Heal someone born blind. And Jesus is going to say these words to those unbelieving Pharisees. He's going to say, listen, because you say you can see, you are blind. If only you were blind, then you would see. Because you are judging in the narrowness of your experience. In the narrowness of your thoughts. And we do it all the time in churches, right? If you're conservative, you say, they're charismatic, all emotion. God doesn't work there. <laughs> and when you're more on the charismatic side, you look at the conservative people and say, ha, ha, they're just about rules and regulations, too stuffy, there's no spirit there. See what I'm saying? What do we do? We love to look across the aisle and say what? We have more. We know more. And then Jesus comes. Not as the king they were looking for, but what? The servant. The one who said, listen, the last shall be first. As they were begging to be at his right hand and his left at at the throne, expecting him to overthrow the Romans. He was preparing to give up his life, not take it. 
came as a helpless baby, not as a raging king, came, as we just read, not to judge, though he could judge, but to reveal the Father. Came as a servant, not just to be served. You see, if they had been looking outside the box that they had made, that they thought the Messiah would be in, they would have seen him. And I have to ask this morning, how often are we missing it? Missing what God is doing. Missing where God is going. Missing what God is doing. Because he's doing it outside the parameters that we've made that we think he can do it in. Things that we think can be forgiven. As we've often looked back at Jonah, remember his anger when God saved the Ninevites. Why did he run and need to get swallowed by a whale and spat back up only to go and preach what God told him to those people? His anger... God, I know your mercy, and I knew you would save them. They didn't deserve it. And I want to remind you that many historians equate the life of those Ninevites with some of the atrocities that that the Nazis committed in their experiments, in their concentration camps. That's what they equated those Ninevites and that people with. And Jonah said, God, I know your mercy. But one thing I know, if anyone deserves it, they don't. And I don't want to be the messenger of it. And God said, no, you will be. Because you know what? I've forgiven you, and I'm big enough to forgive them too. Who's outside of God's forgiveness? What's defined the narrowness of your experience? The narrowness of what you've heard. And perhaps today, the only thing limiting God is the limits that you've placed on him in your own life, in your own experience. And you haven't spoken because you haven't believed that he's big enough to speak. You haven't stood firm in the faith Because you haven't believed in this loving Father that is faithful and will be with you no matter what. You haven't gone and taken that step of faith because you've limited just how big you think he is. And that the fact that when you do, he's got you. God is able. The Father is there. But are we willing to trust, as Jesus said, listen, he who sent me is with me, and he has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. My encouragement this morning is this. In the midst of a great warning, the evidence was everywhere. Jesus was the Messiah they were waiting for. By birthright through the line of Mary, by the significant miracles, the signs that had been foretold that only the Messiah would do, he did. And by the testimony, not his own, but of the Father who sent him, he was everything they were waiting for. But he was also everything they missed because they wouldn't allow their box to be broken. As we go out these doors, great challenge this week. Am I willing to allow God to break my box? To show up outside of the context I've placed him in? Am I going to watch for him? Not just in the narrowness of my experience, but in the vastness of his incredible works and the ways that I know. This is the God we serve, who's forgiven you all your sins and is able to forgive all those of others too.
who is able to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. And here's the problem. (laughs) Their imagination had grown cold. (laughs) They missed it. And as we go out these doors, we should begin to expect the unexpected. Not be surprised when God shows up (laughs) in the way we least expect it. Because that's who God is. That's what God does. In his time, in his way, he's speaking, are we listening? Because each and every time, and I had a, I had a great time with some friends, and, and just a practical story this last week, met some friends that we served with in ministry. They left ministry also to, uh, as God was leading and have been renting, and the whole time they were looking for a home on Vancouver Island as they were renting and knew that their rental time was coming short. And as they were looking, after having lived most of their lives in ministry, uh, were in many ways saying, how are we ever going to afford a home? And as we all know what's happening on Vancouver Island, right? As they sat down with their children, they made a list. And on that list were things that they needed. We need this many bedrooms this many bathrooms, we need a kitchen to make food, we need, we need, we need. And there were about 12 things on the list that they needed. Then they said to the kids, let's dream big for a moment. What do you want? Because let's have that in the prayer too. Let's not just have what we need. Let's pray about God. Sometimes he does a little extra. What do you guys want? What's the kids' first response? Swimming pool, right? And they're like, okay swimming pool right and they're writing it down and they wrote it down and they wrote down hey you know what it'd be nice to have a garage to fix the stuff in and da 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 and on they wrote and they began looking and they've looked for a year and, and and as they looked they looked and they looked and houses would come up on the market and as quick as they came up on the market guess what would happen gone just like that anything in their price range and it got to the point where their kids began to get a little bit jaded. And in fact, they spent a weekend at a, at a Bible camp. And while they were at a Bible camp, a house came on the market and then left. And the kids began to say, if we hadn't been there doing that church stuff, we wouldn't have missed that house. And they began to get a little bit jaded about God's provision. And they began to look at their list and go, hey, you know what? It's starting to look like we may have to sacrifice not just the wants list, But maybe we can sacrifice a little bit on the needs list and get something, just something, right? Then they get a phone call from a realtor and he says, listen, something's come up. You have to come now. And a house comes up and they, he gets off work and they book it down and here's a house. And to say that it was at least a third below market value, if not more, to say the least, came up half an acre, fruit trees, swimming pool, right? Uh, Overlooking a a lake, uh, one of the big lakes in Duncan, Mount Zuhalem. Uh, uh, Listen, they they get there. Uh, One of the wife's want list, big plastic sink in the laundry room, right? Uh, they, They say, one better. There's a laundry chute from every room that falls into the laundry room. And at that moment, my wife was like, we settled. Why did we settle? (laughs) Right? Why weren't we trusting God for more? Right? Listen, they got in. They hear the, and and normally the the people have to get out when you see their home, right? The people were there. And and the wife kind of says, you know, as soon as we get an offer, I think we're just going to sell because we just want to get this over with. And they're like, quick. And they like made an offer like that night. And they got the house. And it was such a good deal that when they went into the mortgage broker office, they were famous. They walked in the door and the lady kind of goes, hey, everyone, these are the people that got the house. They say, these are the people that have four leaf closer and horseshoes in their back pockets. And they said, no, I want to tell you something. We believe in Jesus. Like it was that good a deal. And it didn't just check all the boxes. There were about five more that weren't on the want list. Below what they thought they needed uh, to do for a mortgage. How cool is that, right? But here was the thing. 
they had started to look what? Here's what they were hoping God would do. And then they had become jaded and slowly what? Okay, God, it's going to be ugly. It's going to be gross. There's going to be nasty neighbors. There's going to be, there's going to be. Here's all the compromise. And in one moment, guess what happened? Oh, wait, God can do this. And then they said, oh, and by the way, a week previous, our daughter had a friend come home and one of her friends had a rare cancer disease, I can't remember what it was, healed. She's never seen anything like that. And all of a sudden her, her, her walk with the Lord is on fire again. These things just kept happening. And again, what kept happening? Expectations, broadening, broadening, broadening. Why? Because this is what God can do. But if you keep looking like this, you'll miss it. And that's what was happening with the Pharisees. Couldn't see it. Couldn't comprehend it. What do you see God doing? What sickness is too great for him to heal? What lost soul too far for him to save? What need too great to fulfill? And, and, and though I feel now that I settled because I need a pool and a hot tub and a sauna, I settled. Listen, we're not all going to get all the boxes checked, are we? But listen, he will check the ones we need. And if you're lonely, he can provide friendship and companionship. And if you're needy, he, he can provide resources. And if you're hungry, there's food. Listen, seek first the kingdom of God and what? All these things will be added unto you. But they failed to see it because they didn't believe it. And their lens was too small. As we go out the door this week, we go what? Expect the unexpected. Because we worship a God who is great. We worship the Son who why? Because he was sent, empowered, and used by the Father, God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we can this morning read word, hear testimony, be reminded that so often we limit you by what we think you will do, by what we think we see, by what we think we know, by how we think you will show when in reality today, we need to have faith. Faith in a God who saves. Faith in a God who loves. Faith in a God who provides. Faith in a God who forgives. I pray that you would give us that faith that views this world from the largeness of the Father's hand. Thank you for all that you are today. Thank you that you are with us. Never leave us nor forsake us. And that today you are the great provider. And I pray that today again, that you would keep us in that place where we see you, where we know you, where we abide in you, and where in all things, as the Son, so we live in you. Thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.